This another episode of Frame and Reference. I'm your host, Kenny McMillan, and today we've got production designer Grant Major on the cast. Um, at the beginning of season two, you might recall that I said I was expanding Frame and Reference beyond just cinematographers and camera people into um, jobs that interface with the cinematographer as well. So directors, production designers, colorists, um, you know, maybe, maybe we'll get a, like a first AC in here. That could be really interesting. But, you know, the kind of around the the world of cinematography while still focusing on cinematographers. So this is the first one. We got Grant Major, who is um, a legend in his own right. Um, he and uh, Jane Campion, the director of Power of the Dog, actually shot their first film in New Zealand uh, back in 1990, I believe he said. Um, and so it's cool to see them together again. I believe he also said that was the first like feature shot in New Zealand, which is fascinating. It's just it was really cool. We spend a bit of time talking about like the history of cinema in New Zealand, because while the art form is only 100 years o- old um, overall in New Zealand, it's even newer. Um, but, you know, like I said, he, he's a production designer for um, uh, Power of the Dog and also uh, the Lord of the Rings trilogy, which um, we don't really get into very much, <laughs> but, uh, you know, he, he is that, um, and yeah, so this is a lot of fun. This one is going to, if you're a, um, indie filmmaker, this one's going to be really important for you. Um, or if, uh, you know, you're trying to get into production design, uh, I think it'll be valuable to hear, um, Grant's perspective on things. Uh, I certainly learned some things that I know I'm going to take into my, like I said, indie filmmaking. It doesn't really, I suppose it, it helps, um, with cinematography too, in the sense that uh, you two need to work together to make sure that the look is what you're getting, um, especially with like colors and stuff. And actually, in a future podcast, uh, speaking with a cinematographer, um, we really hammer down the color thing. So uh, yeah, this is a great one. Uh, I think you're going to enjoy it. So please uh, begin to enjoy. <laughs> Uh, please go ahead and listen to the podcast you already selected. This is my conversation with Grant Major. The way that we always get started on these is just asking, um, how did you get into filmmaking? Were you always kind of a, uh, fil- I know, I know New Zealand wasn't necessarily a, a bastion of, uh, film production early on, but like what kind of got you there? Was it through theater or something? Yeah, this is, uh, this is going back a long way. Actually, it's, uh, I'm 66 now. And I think I, when I graduated film school, they, um, they actually promised everybody a job at my uh, art school institution. Bad. Pretty amazing. <laughs> and um, But I wasn't interested in going into advertising and some of those sort of more um, obvious channels. Um, I was uh, sort of picked up by a, a guy, a very interesting man, actually, Tony Stones, his name was, who, who at the time was running the design department of a company called South Pacific Television. And at the time, television was... Um, a sort of a national, nationally owned thing, much like, um, not sure what the equivalent is in America, I'm afraid, but PBS. PBS, like yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, at the time they sort of divided up New Zealand into four different regions and New Ze- and Auckland, where I come from, Auckland, New Zealand, had its own regional television station, South Pacific Television, it was called then, um, which was sort of based um, fairly loosely on the BBC system it's like a little mini bbc so we had it's the corporation i should say had its own design department graphics costume construction drama department comedy um light entertainment um everything you could think of news of course you know there's a flagship and so the design department um you know used to service all these different little um uh program making um departments and um so i was was, um brought on as an assistant set designer and taught the trade um to uh design sets which is interesting because i had designed graphics when i was at art school which Mm -hmm. was a largely a two-dimensional sort of discipline and i was immediately thrown into this 3d thing but fortunately i i had um studied uh drafting at school, at school, at secondary school. And um, so I knew a little bit about how to techni- draw technically. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, I was really thrown in the deep end because really New Zealand, it's a, it's a, you know, land mass wise, it's sort of the equivalent of England or Japan, but population wise, it's the equivalent of, I don't know, Albuquerque or something like that. It's got like, you know, at the time, at the time might've had about 4 million people in it. But, uh, uh, so, you know, it was, um, the audience was quite small that we had and, and they were, they were able to throw me into the deep end. Really. So I learned really through, um, trial and error mostly, um, in terms of set designing and, and, uh, I was, um, actually given a job, my first, within three months, actually, of joining that corporation, I was sent down to a tiny island called Stewart Island at the very bottom of New Zealand. Those people who know it, New Zealand's got the North Island, the South Island, and a little island down the bottom. And I was designing a shipwreck um, movie called The Wreck of the General Grant. And uh, that was a fantastic experience for me because it sort of, it sort of galvanised in, in me what um, production design could be. They used to call it... Um, set design back then, but, you know, what, essentially what production design could be, which is a combination of an exterior physical exercise and bringing something to the camera, but also in the, um, we did studio stuff with, with uh, you know, um, miniature photography and uh, various um, little set builds and things like that. And it was a really beautiful combination to me of the things I loved, being on the out, being in the great outdoors and the sort of design technical kind of um, thing that uh, that uh, you know I was able to do. So you know the early early beginnings planted the seed of of um, what I continued doing for the next sort of forty five years. So more than that now, actually. So yeah. Years. So uh, yeah, went we from there to um, I. I stayed at the South Pacific Television for a number of years and then left to go to the BBC in London proper, um, which was a, a, you know, it was incredible sort of experience. It was amazing. It was, um, I was at the television centre as an assistant set designer still, um, but it was like a formal training there because the BBC um, has its own way of doing, had its own way of doing things back then. It was a very formal process. So the way I design a set uh, laid out on a sheet of paper um, and t- with technical drawings was a contract of sorts, you know. So this the mm-hmm. drawing contract would go to construction companies and every single element of the design had to be on that one drawing. The, all the paint samples and all the, should I say, all the, you know, um, everything was catalogued, I should say, you know, in terms of what it had to be on in the set. And so whenever um, the designer would come in and want to change it, you'd have to fill out a contract variation form, you know. So uh, all these things, it was very, very formalised. And it sounds kind very of dry, British. Of course, but, <laughs> you know, but it was, it gave me what I think is my, was my apprenticeship, really. My apprenticeship in, in uh, set design was really formulated at, at the BBC. And, oh, man, oh, man, I worked on some, Brilliant shows over there, just incredible shows with incredible people that, um, you know, many of whom are still in the business, you know, as, as film designers now. So, in fact, I was told I used to sit at Ridley Scott's old desk at the BBC for a period of time. So it's kind of hallowed ground at that point, you know, <laughs> um, even way back then. But, yeah, yeah. you know, I, I just sort of uh, um, worked my way through the BBC system. I became a permanent staff member there. Yeah became a uh, uh, move from an assistant set designer to a set designer um, and um, but was assisting um, on mainly period period um, dramas there was a lot of co-production with CBS and BBC at that at that time and there'd be these big fancy elaborate um, uh, costume dramas I think I, I worked on um, um, it was called the Invisible Man by HG Wells yeah um, there was uh, Daphne Du Maurier's um, story of, um, oh, sorry, senior moment. I can't quite remember the name of it now. But <laughs> no, that's fine. I have to say it was, you know, it took me to Italy and to Europe and, and as well as, as, as England. And um, on My Cousin Rachel, it was called, yeah. So, you know, they were two of the ones that, that sort of stick in my mind. But um, it was just like um, in the fast lane, you could say, of, of um, television as it was then. Um, 
more by sort of accident than design, I ended up back in New Zealand, um, bumped into an old girlfriend of mine, and we sort of um, we're still together after all this time. So there you um, go. I sort of uh, what was what was a television dominated industry in the when I left New Zealand had then changed. You know, they they really um, wound up the South Pacific television design departments and set everybody free. And um, now it was a sort of a freelance um, industry. And the and the government at the time used to have these sort of um, tax, um, the sort of tax break um, opportunities for producers to be able to make um, uh, films back then. So this is, there was a very embryonic kind of New Zealand film industry um, that I hooked into then. I came in as an art director then because in New Zealand, you know, if, you, if, you, if you've spent time overseas, you sort of have a lot of brownie points for that and you, and you can sure. sort of come in at a, at, a, at a greater level, you could say. Um, so I, I called myself an art director then, and uh, but I was I was an on-set, what they called an on-set art director. So, you know, in terms of the hierarchy, I wasn't sort of the designer. I would be, a, I'd be the sort of points man on, on location for these um, films that were being made. Putting um, out fires. <laughs> yeah, putting out fires. and But, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good way of putting it. Really. Um, but also I used to share my time with doing things that were not in the film business. I was I had a, um, a friend of mine that I'd met in the uh, film business back then, Logan Brewer, who was a um, – who he went into sort of designing events and, and um, sort of tourist uh, destinations. So I designed with him the New Zealand Expo Pavilion for oh. Brisbane and in, in, in Australia, and then latterly the uh, Expo Pavilion for New Zealand in Spain in Seville in Spain. So that was a really fantastic experience, and in, in um, sort of segueing out of out of using my same skills that I had, but segueing into sort of the built a proper built environment. Um, where people would go and visit it and see it one to and, and firsthand, you know, that was interesting. And the in the British Commonwealth, which we still are part of, they have the Commonwealth Games. So I designed right. the opening and closing ceremonies for the Commonwealth Games and various other things like that. So I had a few strings to my bow back, back then, but yeah. um, that all changed uh, without sorry without raving on for too long. Oh no, but, go ahead. Uh, we got plenty of time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, without wanting to bore you. Anyway, I, I did meet up with um, a producer, Bridget Eichen, back then, who ran a, a, a production company called Hibiscus Films, and she had a project with a with a director called Jane Campion, who had just come back to New Zealand from Australia, you know, young um, person graduated film school, made a film over there, and was coming back to do a project here called um, An Angel at My Table, and that sort of got me back into into the film business proper. Yeah, that I honestly I I don't know if I could uh write a better sort of starting to current career like um you know cuz a lot of times on this podcast we've talked to people about how maybe they did come up more formally, you know, maybe going to AFI or something like that coming from an artistic background or people who are just full on indie and it kind of sounds like you had a, a nice little uh coasting through both I don't know about coasting that sounds like it was easy but uh, a nice little pathway through through kind of both sides, you know, very formal and very kind of um, free form almost. Yeah, it was, it was interesting because I look back and I, I see that um, it was really some people who picked me up and mentored me at that time because I always considered myself to be way too young to be having the responsibility that I was doing at the time. <laughs> you know, but right back doing, as I mentioned, this thing on Stewart Island, uh, the wreck of the General Grant, that was Anthony Stones who just like said, okay, you can, you can design this, see how you go and get back to me on the phone if you have problems and I'll, I'll see if I can help you out, you know. So there's that person. There, there was, um, there was uh, Don Giles was a, a designer that I met up with at the BBC and he, he really sort of took me under his wing and, um, and really taught me the ropes about um, – the BBC system and, you know, actually, I, I remember we used to walk around the streets of London and he used to say, okay, Grant, when was that building made? You know, tell me about the era of that building. Tell me about the era of this building and tell me what the different eras are in that one building. And, of course, you know, London's got that huge depth of architectural sort of, um, you know, genesis. So it's, it, I did learn a lot through just um, that, that sort of, um, yeah, but yeah being, being just shepherded by these really 
brilliant people. Going to actually, before I ask this, uh, you just reminded me when I was in uh, college, I, I did uh, a handful of random jobs. And at one point I was working at ABC and uh, I was back in, you know, I worked at ABC in, in L.A. and then I went back to Arizona and they had they kept me on to do random things like on campus outreach and stuff like that. But then um, I guess this must have been 2010 or so we had a, yeah, we had a Obama had like a, a town hall, like a, you know, political thing. So they had me sort of half run that at 20 years old. They were just like, you're going to go. And there's like set designers and product, everyone building this whole thing out. And I'm just like, for some reason I'm in charge, but the exact same thing happened to me where we're building this whole thing. And then the main production designer, uh, go like, looks at his watch basically and goes, all right, I got to fly back to New York. You're in, t- uh, you're in charge of this tomorrow and just takes off. <laughs> and so like it's the cameras are all set up and i guess i'm just because i became the uh the point man the the put out the fire guy i was like okay i'm doing this all day this is a trip like <laughs> well, there's nothing like that pressure to keep you on your toes isn't it you learn a lot from those exercises oh man i had i had a photo of uh me and uh one of the talents this guy dl hughley and i didn't realize it at the time i was wearing all black but unfortunately I had a, a, a white um, sort of logo on my front on the front and I didn't realize it, but it was actually made out of like 3M material. <laughs> so in the background of like the, the sort of behind the set camera, there's just this glowing skull in the back <laughs> of the thing. I was like, all right, yeah. Set black is not reflective. I'll tell you what, that's a mistake. <laughs> um, but what I was going to ask was, uh, w- you know, with all that training, do you kind of walk through life seeing the, the code in the matrix, you know, like just constantly identifying, you know, like 1980s, uh, Victorian era, you know, modernist, that's Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright again, look at him go, you know, that kind of thing. Oh, yeah, like I, I sure do. You know, it's, it's, you know, when you lead a sort of design life, it's, you're, you're sort of you're immersed in that. We, we are, we're, we live it sort of um, moment to moment, really. And I remember, I remember reading, you know, when you when you embark on a design career, you're on a permanent war against ugliness, you know. And so a lot of it's to do with recognizing really good aesthetics, you know. Oh, there's a really nice piece of proportion. There's a really nice color combination. Or, you know, here they've used uh, a really nice, nice sort of Frank Lloyd Wright um, motif on a building or, or something like that. So it's it's period styles, but it's also you know, what looks good, what's looking good here, what's working here. And, uh, you know, but also, you know, it's, it's not just beautiful things. You know, I'm interested in quirks and um, personality details and things like that. I notice all the time, not just in buildings, people's clothes, interesting cars. There's a fabulous kind of picture on someone's wall or a, a combination of elements that make up the decoration of someone's room. You know, it's a, all those sorts of things are sort of filed away. Um, and, uh, you know, we could, we're able to sort of draw on them at a later point, I guess, or maybe it just turns into a sort of a mush of soup, you know, of stuff that I can, that, that sort of affects my general sort of aesthetics, but I de- definitely, um, live that life. Yeah. 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 Do you, uh, have any sort of, I don't want to say main, but sort of larger references or, or, um, inspirations that you kind of really took to, uh, coming up or, or even now? Um, <clears throat> that's interesting. Um, I'm not sure about that, but I mean, being a child of the sort of 50s and 60s, I seem to have have a modernist kind of bent. You know, I do like modernism. I like the clean lines of modernism, and I like the sort of revolutionary aspect of it, um, breaking away from what was there before, you know, and I very much like the materiality of modernism. So, you know, I've managed to find a modernist house here in, in Auckland, such as it is. It's sort of an Anglo-modernist. Um, uh, but I also gravitate towards that sort of aesthetic generally. Yeah. yeah. I, for You know, for me, it, it's um, modernism is great. Uh, for some reason, uh, Art Deco just really, I like, and I don't know what it is about that. It seems very, like, whimsical. Yeah. You know? That's exuberant, so, isn't it? So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It might have been the uh, the old bat watching the old Batman cartoon. I think there was a lot of uh, Art Deco, just like yeah, sort of thing. But yeah, it's it's always stuck with me for architecture. Um, you know, uh, 
I'm from the Bay Area of, of California, and um, there's a great documentary called uh, Fog City Mavericks about sort of the film industry coming up in the Bay. You know, the, these sort of guys who uh, guys and girls who were outside of the L.A. studio system. And um, New Zealand seems to be one of those places that mirrors that in a way and, and almost grabs the baton and sprints with it because um, and you're kind of uh, not to toot your horn too much, but like. I, I would argue that you're kind of in that um, genesis of of the film industry in New Zealand really taking off. And I was wondering if you could speak to uh, how correct that <laughs> statement is yeah. um, and also kind of looking back on it, what that sort of uh, means to you or, or even doesn't. Yeah, yeah, great. You know, I talk, I talk rather blithely about... Um, coming back from the BBC and stepping into the film business here. But it's like, um, it's like a miracle of sorts, really, that that actually happens in a country that's so small and dominated by agriculture. You know, essentially, we had been up to then anyway, in such a uh, backwater of sheep. And, uh, you know, there's nothing really more to be said about New Zealand at, at the time. You know, I, I'm being a bit disingenuous, but it was essentially, okay. from an exterior point of view, it's, it's a place where there was like 30 million sheep and 3 million people. Um, <clears throat> uh, there's certainly no film business that I, it's film schools or anything like that that I could ever um contemplate going to other than leaving the leaving the country you know there was one in sydney um but that was really for directors and dps mainly um so this notion of a film business happening in new zealand was kind of an um was a far-flung kind of um american kind of idea really um of course we made our own tv but um I think the, the government does like to promote itself, you know, in the hurly burly of all these different countries in the world competing for attention. Um, there's, uh, you know, New Zealand does need to stand up and sort of wave the flag, otherwise people don't know we're there so much. And it did, at the time, it sort of related back to trade, you know, okay, there's New Zealand, oh, let's kind of buy its butter or whatever, you know, milk. <laughs> um, and, but, you know, se- selling ourselves as a sort of a cultural, a cultural, uh, or an exporter of our cultural uh, of our culture was um, kind of a new idea. Actually, it was quite quite a new idea. And, and you know, I won't bury this conversation too much in politics and things. But New Zealand was going through a very um, uh, turbulent time at the time. We were actually like our apron strings had been cut from the the um, British Commonwealth when they joined the East the EU. What's now the EU? So New Zealand was on its own and um, the newly independent country had to sort of find its voice in, in the, in the um, foreign media. So, you know, <clears throat> um, making our own films was part of that, I think. And, um, you know, we did have very good writers and we got, you know, um, we had technicians, I suppose, who were, no, I'll start again. The visiting films used to come to New Zealand and train up local people like um filmmaker, uh, you know, like cameraman and grips and um, lighting technicians and things like that. So we had the beginnings of those sorts of skills and translating them into films was, um, you know, as part of our growing up, basically, part of our growing up. And um, we got to start somewhere. We were doing these kind of fairly um, rough and ready, um, fairly raw um uh, movies back back at the time, but then you know I must say it really started with Jane Campion and an angel at my table, which I mentioned in, the, in 1990, making films that were very um, beautifully sort of sensitive about a New Zealand writer. You know, who, who would be interested in a New Zealand writer around the world? You know, and but you know J- um, Janet Frame that the film was about was um, very much one of these writers that had a sort of an international voice and um so the film actually did extremely well and from that point we started taking ourselves seriously as a film business i would say you know well then there's a before and an after that point and i think the 1990s was really a change where we had a lot more confidence in the things we were able to say to the world and 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 that we proved to ourselves that you can actually sell movies to the world and uh, people would would watch them they tended to be more art house art house films because the New Zealand accent is not the same as the, around the world and we tended to be categorised to this sort of um, art house sort of genre, subgenre. But, um, 
nevertheless, we were getting our stories out there, which is important. Well, yeah, it seems like uh, especially comedy now, too, like New Zealand comedy seems to be a very perhaps niche, but um, hugely popular around the world. Yeah, yeah. Well, I would say I would I would place that even later in the time scale. Actually, I'd oh place yeah, that's probably more recent. Thousands, but... or even or, yeah, yeah. Or so you know, with obviously with Taika Waititi and uh, the the um, the um, rec- the flight of the Concords and things like that. They, man, oh man, they've been they're brilliant. And uh, we never really thought we had a very humorous side to New Zealand stories because back then in the eighties, especially, they were pretty dark. You know, there were <laughs> lots of I don't know, man against. Um, I don't know, nature of guns and all that sort of stuff. But now, you know, actually being able to laugh at ourselves is really something. And so I think we took a leaf out of Australia's book in a way. Australia always had a very good, a very good um, comedy um, uh, filmmaking sort of history. So, you know, finally we caught up with them. Yeah. Do you, um, what are some of the things that, uh, this is an inelegant question, but what, what are the, some of the things that you've noticed about sort of, let's say the, New Zealand way of filmmaking that you guys developed more organically versus um, sort of the LA style, let's say, which is uh, developed organically and then had rote rules and kind of, you know, this is how we do things. Cause I've noticed Australian filmmakers have a very um, not to put you in the same category, but I've noticed all the Australian filmmakers I've talked to have a certain ethos about them. That's very workmanlike and very like, yeah, we just, we don't really have a lot. So we're just getting it done, you know? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, New Zealand always had to make do with not very much, you know, because we we um, not a wealthy country, and um, we've this is so small, so everyone knows each other, you know. And this industry really it has the capacity to make maybe three or four films at the same time, you know, big films at the same time, and then we start to run seriously run into shorter people. Um, so we 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 do, um, you know. We all have this sort of working relationship with each other, and when and when when um, visiting uh, producers and directors step into this, they find oh well, you know it's like a it's like a family almost. You know? um, so we we do we do have that. We're also you know we're not New Zealanders by character. We're not um, big sort of um, loud people. You know we do tend to be a little quieter, and and we work very hard. <laughs> um, but also we don't have the sort of same union um, structures that Australia and uh, England and America do. We, we do have our guidebooks and we do ad- adhere to a sort of a, a, um, a set of sort of um, principles, I suppose you could say. Um, but uh, we don't have this very hard and fast um, uh, industrial sort of structure. Right. Thing. And one thing I did notice in particular when I went to England was the the ladder that you had to climb to be able to get from a assistant set designer to a set designer and then to a senior set designer and then a, you know, like a design assistant and then a designer. And then it's, it's, it seemed to be like endless. It seemed to like uh, disappear up into the perspective wise into the sky, you know? So um, we do, uh, and it's a double edged sword. We do, we are able to sort of jump ahead. And, um, you know, I was able to call myself a, a, um, uh, art director in New Zealand without any art director's union saying, no, you're not, no. But at right. the same time, it's a double-edged sword because people call themselves that and they're not really qualified for it as well. But so, you know, it's a it's a little looser, you could say, but um, I think now now in particular in, in 2022, you know, we've had so much experience of foreign films coming through that we're, we're our skills are quite equitable, but um, we just don't have those hard and fast structures. Yeah. The, the, uh, familialness, is that a word? Um, kind of, <laughs> I'm not going to lie. It sounds, uh, envy, enviable, you know, having kind of the thing that kind of sucked about getting out of school and, and getting into the real world was you weren't making films with your friends anymore. You know, mm-hmm. it was a job. And I, and I feel like if, uh, we just kept on that, like me and all my friends together and then we just kept getting bids that, that feels like it would have been more exciting. Is that kind of the feel? Cause I know there's that joke, which is funny for you, but I know there's that joke that like pretty much everyone in the country at least was an extra in Lord of the Rings. Um, you know, there's that kind of, <clears throat> there's that kind of bond, you know, there's a bond. Yeah, for sure. For sure. There is, you know, we're quite, quite tight here. And, um, 
yeah, it's just it's just the the nature of the scale of it. I think you know we we mm. um, we all have to get along with each other, and uh, we're all, we're all a band of brothers really. But I think it must be the same. You know, when, when you've worked on a on a feature film anywhere, you know, you do make connections and you do, do get a bunch of friends around. You know, so I think it has the nature of doing that. But just we do that from one show to the next, to the next, to the next. And I do like to get out of, you know, offshore sometimes to break out sure. of that and just to, uh, to be sure that I'm, I am um, not working under some sort of delusion of, of um, you know, my skills and all that sort of stuff. So. <laughs> making Checking the size of the pond, making sure you're the right size fish and all. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I think it's, it's very necessary. It's actually been very necessary and very important to the New Zealand film business that, Foreign um, productions have come here, and they do so more and more now. Um, to use to use the industry, to use the people, and to use the locations and the, all of our technologies, because it's definitely upskills all of us. I mean, they've been making um, Avatar here now for several years, and you can imagine the sort of skills that are rubbed off on the local people here. It's been brilliant. Yeah. You know? We're we're digital, and all those sorts of people are like world class institutions now, really, because foreign investment, foreign. Um, I call them foreign, but you know, we're all brothers around the world anyway. friends, yeah. <laughs> bigger industries i should say you know coming in and, and trusting us you know with with uh, responsibilities it's brilliant yeah have you been uh sort of perhaps i don't know if you're allowed to talk about it by the way if you say anything you don't want in here we can chop it out like we we edit but uh were you able to uh sort of maybe rub shoulders with the avatar productions or not because i imagine that's it's so weird that like the first Avatar came out in 08 and now everyone's pretending like it wasn't the biggest film on the planet for like ever. Yeah. yeah. No, uh, um, it was very much a closed shop, the Avatar thing. If you're not in it, you forget yeah. it. You, know, you, you couldn't even approach the buildings. You know, it was, it's no one's talking about it and it's very much, uh, uh, you know, the book's shut on that. So I'm not, I wasn't asked to be part of it and I haven't been part of it. I have um, a friend of mine, obviously, who are, and, um, you know, they they are uh, done the journey, been doing the journey together. Honestly, it seems like so long ago. It must be, must be four years ago, easily four years ago, they started work on it. So, well, they're uh, shooting like eight of them, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't even know, but multiple. Yeah. Films, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, talking about that sort of double-edged sword of, of um, being a, an amateur and, and overrating yourself, perhaps, that's a huge thing in uh, cinematography right now where, well, I shouldn't say in cinematography, but the, but now with the proliferation of uh, accessible, high-quality cameras um, and sort of a learning base online, it's a, it's much easier for people to grab a camera and, and sh- by definition of their knowledge and access to equipment say i'm a i'm a cinematographer now um and the advantage to that obviously as we've said millions of times is the democratization of filmmaking more voices are allowed to speak we get more interesting stories you know um same in, in much the same way that hearing stories from new zealand is great hearing individual stories is great um but on the same time uh you end up not i guess not knowing who to trust you know not knowing where anyone's coming from, you know, the signal to noise ratio is a lot higher. And I was wondering if you could speak to um, if that's as much of an issue in production design. Is, is that double edged sword quite wide or is it more like is it easier to kind of weed out people who are because um, it's not necessarily production design isn't uh, sort of one of the more traditional paths that people take, you know, the directing, writing, producing kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, good. You know, when, when people um, ask me, you know, how do I get into production design? How do I become a production designer? I always um, encourage them to go to film school, maybe, if there, if there is one. But in this part of the world, there, there's, there aren't so many. But I say do an architecture degree. You've got to do a, get a degree and a discipline that teaches you about um, the formalities of three-dimensional design and materials and budgeting and, um, you know, all these sorts of processes. Okay, it's not filmmaking, but it, it's, it does have some common threads to it. So making good foundations for a career like that. Um, so a lot of people do come up through the film business. Um, they may go into, come in as an assistant props 
person, you know, a props maker or something like that, and then work their way up to being a props master and then want to become an art director. And, and then, you know, there's, that's valid. But to me, the building blocks of design is to do with those disciplines that I mentioned, you know, the, the sort of architectural disciplines. So, you know, um, but there's designers and there's designers, you know, some people thrive on the sort of, um, I don't know, maybe they come at it from a different direction, I should say. But all I can really comment on it is the way that I do it, which is sort of formalist, if you like. Well, so, yeah. Oh, I was going to say that, um, again, it, I'm kind of uh, somewhat envious because that because it is nice to have a set of skills that are, I don't want to say hard and fast, but, you know, they're, they're a true set of skills. When I tell people I'm a cinematographer, it's not like, either they don't know what I'm talking about or they go like, oh, so you take pictures, you know, and it, it's just kind of like, all right, cool. Whereas if you go like, I'm an architect, it's like, wow, all right. You know, there's a lot more and you have like a hard set of skills you can use. You know, you could potentially fix something. Maybe I don't know. I can't do that. I can't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. Well, uh, even uh, I tried describing my job to my father and he never, you could tell it never really, he never really understood, wrapped his head around what it was that I actually did, you know. So, you know, to those people outside the industry, it's always got a sense of mystery to it. Oh, do you know, you know, Kirsten Dunst? Or do you know all these yeah. people? Course, you know, <laughs> Kirsten Dunst. <laughs> that I hang out with them at the pub after a day's shooting or something like that, you know. Yeah. But uh, uh, no, it's a, it is kind of a niche career, actually. And it's, and it's um, you know, I, every day I, I, I sort of congratulate myself on, on um, being in it. So it yeah. does um, satisfy a lot of urges in me, so. Well, and the excitement of being able to, you know, I I have a, f a few friends who are architects that I just I knew friends and, uh, you know, they got they spend years designing a building that's going to live there potentially forever, which is great. But, they, you know, it's kind of very one thing, whereas I assume with your job, there's a lot more variety and, and, and craziness, too. You know, it might be spaceships and then it might be a, a, a ranch, you know, the next day. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's like it's like the best part of architecture. You know, imagine being an architect and you're saying, okay, the skyscraper is going to look like this. That, that might take you a few days to do that, you know. But then you've got to go and design all the toilets and the, I don't know, all the plumbing and all that sort of stuff. You know, but the, the best thing about um, production design is that it's sort of facadist. It's ephemeral, like you touched on before. It's, it's here today and gone tomorrow. But it's also, it's what it looks like and it's what it's, um, how it's sort of, um, it's taken in as part of a, a dramatic kind of um, thing. So it's, it's always pushing, pushing the sort of um, boundaries of, of how we sort of appreciate a, a building. Yeah, so it's a, it's this, this, this industry generally, you know, it's, it's really great because to do with narrative, and I haven't really talked about that, you know, the, this, this narrative aspect of the, of our industry is really, really interesting um, kind of um, place to work in. You know, it's, some people call it sort of fantasy. You know, we, of course, we do spaceships on the one hand, and we do some period Tang Dynasty building and another, and uh, you know, so we get to visit all these all these sorts of places. But everything everything is in the is in the um, uh, everything's to do with how it speaks. You know, what is it saying here? And um, that that to me is the spice in, in, in production design. I, I'm so actually glad you brought that up. Now, now I just feel like this whole podcast is me just going like, man, you're just so cool. Uh, <laughs> the ability to, um, I've always loved like props uh, and whatnot in the sense that, uh, and it, by extension, you know, production design in, in what I'm about to say, mm -hmm. um, is the ability to tell the story before we got there. You know, why, why is this, uh, chair broken right here? You know, why, why is, um, you know, why is the paint like that? Um, and you get to literally design all that, you know, at how much time are you spending in your head? Just kind of going like, and this is where they, uh, you know, threw a bowling ball at the wall and kind of yeah. design, you know, doing that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Well, that's what makes it real. You know, I mean, I've had, um, I mean, Peter Jackson telling me, you know, when we were starting to do Lord of the Rings, you're saying, We've got to believe in Middle Earth, otherwise we won't believe in dwarves and dragons and all that sort of stuff. We have to believe in the everyday physics of an environment and the 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 sort of its own their own history and things like that that they brought 
to that point. You know, so a lot of the work I do, it's not just in sort of the architectural design of things, it's making it feel like it's always been there or that it's brand new or that it's belonged to this person and it had this purpose and then it has this purpose, you know. So it's really giving all these sort of nuances and that are all in the, all in the service of the story um, to uh, all these environments. And I, I think it's, yeah, so it's more than just walls and, and, and decoration, absolutely. Right. Everything's in that, in that sort of narrative service and, the more um, the more I can learn about um, the back history of these sorts of places, and the more successful films of scripts I've read, and the and the films I've been involved in, have got this wealth of detail to them. You know, like Lord of the Rings I just mentioned before has got these incredible books with talking about backstory. You know, the backstory yeah. goes back three thousand years. You know, um, with um, uh, the power of the dog, which I just did recently, it's it's like um, you know there was a set amount of critical instances that happen before we actually get to our story. So um, all those sorts of things are described as best I can in the environments because they all have things to say about about the current situation. Mm. Yeah, D- is there a uh, kind of a memorable um, maybe uh, flair or storytelling element? In- that you put in uh, one of your designs that you're particularly uh, fond of at all? Um, yeah, maybe. Like um, with, uh, I remember um, it's just been 20 years since um, the um, the first Lord of the Rings film came out. And uh, I was talking recently about Bag End and, um, you know, why did you design it in that particular way? And essentially I went through um, it really at, 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 um, at Peter's behest, every single word in the sentence, in the, in the chapter, I should say, that describes Hobbiton, you know, mm. it, and there's so much in there. And, and it also describes kind of where in the path that the gate is and where the gate goes through the hedge into the party field, what's, what the geography of the party field is. It's kind of... It's kind of sweet to be able to go through all of those um, little moments in a very famous book and actually bring them to life is, was was brilliant. But of course, um, you know, any amount of description is still in your head, you know, and in, in, in the reader's head, I should say. So actually pulling them out and and um, uh, and making them physically real is a is another sort of um, profound sort of process, really. You know, it's um, any amount of description is always a um, you know, sort of so so based internally on, on internal things and sort of making it real and practical as a as a yeah, it's a it's a journey. So love doing yeah. that. Well and it's also through your vision, right? Like it's not it's not a one to one uh there's no drawings, you know, you get to kind of put your own little spin on it, which I assume is gratifying. Yeah, well, you know, um I'm you know when you um when you pitch an idea, you know, and you must must find yourself in the same sort of uh, process sometimes. You're pitching an idea to someone who's going to make it happen, uh, pay for it, <laughs> whatever, you know, a producer or whatever. You are pitching a vision in your head. When you say, uh, you know, I picture it this way or I see it this way, um, that when what you see is an image that you've you've composed in your imagination, you know, and getting that out is um, part of the design process, you know, getting that out, getting someone else to picture the same thing hooks in a, um, a producer um, in our industry, you know, getting them to see that, see the, an idea the same way is really um, a very important process. You know, we, we do do it through concept art and all that sort of stuff, but first it's a verbal pitch and um, it's a very powerful medium, you know, pitching an idea to somebody, um, you know, I think we should do it like this because I can see it, you know, happening, you know, against this backdrop and this could happen and, um, you know, all those sorts of things. And when someone else sees the same, sees the same thing, it's a very powerful communication that's just gone on there, you know? Yeah. Mm. It's like, like mental Wi-Fi. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hope I answered yeah, the question. Yeah. 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 Um, so, you know, as I said, but kind of before we got started, I, I have this theory that a lot of films, uh, the cinematographer gets awards for what the production designer actually did. 
um, you know, David Fincher's films tend to come to mind, uh, where the cinematography is very, you know, kind of formal, but the, it's the, uh, sets that are even the color, you know, people are like, Oh, the, the look of his films is this certain greenish color. And every one who's worked with him is like, no, that's the set. It, <laughs> there's not a lot going on in the camera. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to how you interface with the camera department, the cinematographer, what those meetings look like, um, you know, before you start rolling and, and uh, kind of how that relationship forms throughout the film. Yeah. Well, you know, fundamentally, using the power of the dogs as an example, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, fundamentally everything gets filtered through the camera. So there's a strict hierarchy there and, and what I do. So people are seeing my work um, secondhand, you could say, you know, um, and, the, but the beauty of that is that uh, I, the cinematographer can make people see my work in a particular way. You know, it's every single sort of frame is thought through um, and considered. <clears throat> so when I do, when I produce these designs, they are sometimes catering towards a shot that I imagine, and sometimes we've talked it through quite, quite, um, and, you know, sometimes quite analytically. You know, all the sort of elements that make up that shot would be would be planned and, and uh, designed for. Other times, <clears throat> I'm doing my best to create as many opportunities as I can for a, for a cinematographer. So, you know, it, it'll be um, designing a, a set with a lot of a lot of angles that, that could be cool. I also design it um, with lighting in mind, you know, lighting that we've often talked about um, pre um, previously, but sometimes not. You know, sometimes I think, you know, oh, this scene will look really, really good if there's a if there's a light source, a natural light source over there or like an ambient light source from somewhere over here or something like that. And, and it's, again, it's part of that sort of pitch thing, you know, I sort of pitch the, an idea to a cinematographer as, as much as a, as a director in terms of kind of how, it, how the mood of it could fit in the way that I see it. So it's a very sort of symbiotic kind of relationship I have with the, with the DP. But at the end of the day, it's their gig, you know, it's their their shots and um i i um i don't have the ability to be able to sort of dictate anything all i can the best i can do is to is to yeah give as much um creative sort of input as i as i can and then um you know let them run with it really yeah, yeah. well the the light thing especially is a uh you know architecture mainstay you know where's the light coming from where we put in the light which is kind of goes hand in hand with cinematography when you're designing um these spaces for people what what are some of the differences in designing it for film use uh you know flyaway walls aside um that you wouldn't necessarily do in a traditional architectural way or um you know what what, what are some of those things that the the classic school learning wouldn't teach you about the film yeah. method yeah yeah well look um you know, I do, we do do a lot of those sort of tricks, I suppose, where, where we have flyaway walls and things like that. But I must say, nine-tenths of the time, the DPs don't use them. You know, they, they have to move along at a pace normally. Um, the cameras are quite, uh, you know, smaller these days and allow you to sort of get into a corner and and film. And, and I think that this feeling that um, if, you're see, if, you are, if you're looking at a room in a way that's larger than what the room actually is, like if the camera's behind something you know further back than what it would logically be um the audience sort of knows that so the lensing is is tends to be tends to suit the dimensions of a room that you're trying to um that you're trying to be in you know so those sort of technical things are are uh, you know planned for i suppose you know? yeah. you know, but we, do, we do tend to um we do tend to be more um, analytical, I suppose, when those shots become very complicated. You know, if there's a shot that has been planned for by the director that, that needs um, a set design in a particular way or that has to open up in a particular way or has to be covered in a particular way, you know, those sorts of things become, you know, set the geography of, of, of what I'm doing. Uh, often, like like in um, Power of the Dog, the, there's a geography that was required between um, between Rose playing the piano for those people who've seen the film and and uh, Phil's um, viewpoint of there from his bedroom, you know, so yeah. it's a very very sorry, there's, there's a very strict, very strict um, um, 
line of sight, you could say. So, yeah. No, that uh, that scene in particular where he's kind of staring and whistling at her yeah. is uh, b- borderline a horror film. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, and it's it's voyeuristic and it's power play and all those sorts of things. And it's it's, it's a there's a lot of drama in that in that particular piece of geography. And I, I think it's actually the 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 layout of the whole house in some ways was affected by that by that strong sight line. Um, so uh, yeah, I, was, I remember having to flop the design. Of the, of the house at one point just to be able to take that in so yeah those sorts of things are very powerful i think in films and because it's because the, because the way these sorts of scenes are covered is tells so you know has so much drama in it as much as the the, the the room itself so yeah like we were talking about before this symbiotic kind of relationship between dp and 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 designer is is very told told out in scenes like that you know yeah, I, I can't imagine it's always the case where you really get to hammer down with the DP about, you know, where they would like to put stuff. But do you have any sort of, I suppose, anecdotes about a time where that uh, really worked out, where that symbiotic relationship uh, kind of rewarded both of you? Yeah, look, um, I've got to say, like, I, I, I've done so many movies, I tend to concentrate on the ones that I've just done immediately sure. prior to this conversation so <laughs> yeah. the audience, excuse me i'm not talking about things way way back but uh you know i think that ari and i um did spend a lot of time together i mean she spent a lot of time in prep with with us and um the whole design phase and so we we're able to talk through all of these um really important um ways of being able to um, bring the design you know marry the design to the cinematography in much the same way as we married the costume design to the design and the makeup to the design, all these crafts sort of all come together in this one sort of one very tight sort of relationship we had. But um, it was, it was um, with Ari, it was like um, being on the location prior to any planning of what we we're going to do for the power of the doll. And um, okay, where are we going to put this farmhouse? Cause we've built everything. So where are we going to put it in relation to the, the um, property that we're on, you know, in relation to the hills and the, the the approach roads and things like that. So we're able to talk about the fundamentals of kind of what we're going to build, and then the um, the relationship of one building to another. Like, you know, how are they? Um, how should they be laid out in terms of our drama? It's like a stage play almost as well. You can imagine sure. the same sort of things going on. We put this person here because that person says this and that person over there and that comes in that door. And, you know, so all these sorts of geographical things, I'd call them sort of uh, are very important with each other. And then, you know, we talked about the gaps in between the building, between the buildings, you know, what's right, what are our viewpoints towards the different aspects of the location that we really want to look at? Mm-hmm. Where, are the, where are the openings in the buildings, the doorways that frame it's like a frame within a frame. You like, you know, where the doorways and the windows are. There's a great John Ford through. shot in the movie. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think they really worked. You know, and and uh, a lot of you know, and it was, none of it was accidental. You know, everything was was thought through and we talked about and and um, it was thrilling actually to be with this very communicative um, group of people, Jane, Ari, and I, to be able to plan all these things out. Yeah. Well, and that, that, uh, thoughtfulness, uh, very much comes through, you know, I was just talking, uh, we were talking about uh, nightmare alley where you could really see that, that same thoughtfulness, um, two completely different films, but, uh, power of the dog definitely feels like a whole, um, cohesive planned thought. You know, there's not an ounce of fat on that film. Mm -hmm. Um, and going back to the house, I'm sure people have said this to you before, but that house, uh, does tell a lot about Phil's character. You know, it's, it's dark. It, you know, there's not an, not one, not to say ounce again, I hate repeating words, but there's, there's no feminine influence in that house at all. Um, you know, it really speaks to, uh, you know, the man just kind of being left alone, you know, his parents take off and he's just like, this is my cave now. Mm. Yeah. It's very sort of nuanced really. Um, it's very stark as well. I like that sort of. There's a very light and dark kind of thing to it, and uh, and a and a and a, bold, a broadness to it as well. You know, spaciousness to it, which I which I very much enjoyed doing. You know, the spaciousness of the ranch and the the um, the the 
you know, when you have all these spaces, it's the commuting from one place to another actually has significance to it. Um, but, but uh, you know, uh, Phil Burbank, um, he's a wonderfully complex character with uh, with these kind of warped kind of um, personality things to him, I suppose you'd say, you know, that he's been, uh, he's had, um, he's had very um, psychological experiences that have impacted on him and trying to, play that out in the in the interiors has been really interesting you know phil himself uh, per the book per the original source material um had gone to university gone to like um i'm not quite sure which one it was yale or something like that and learned classics mm-hmm. you know? so here's a here's a guy who's um who we see now as a sort of a raw cowboy sort of um cattle rancher knowing his greek you know his greek and his latin you know so there's something really beautiful about that juxtaposition of things. And I, th- and I, I sort of tried to play that about it in the house, you know, so the house is, it's got this sort of formality to it. It's, it's big bone, but it's also got a classic kind of thing to it that um, that Phil has sort of assumed, you know, he sort of pushed that to one side and it's sort of, it's it's merged back into the darkness in, in, in some ways, the same way that his personality has. And he's, He's concentrating on being the man, you know, being more of a man than everybody else because of what he's having to keep a lid on here, you know. So yeah. um, there's a it's, it's, it's a just an incredible opportunity to be able to talk about a character like that in ways that are not text and not language, but in objects, you know, and in environments. So you know, I'm I'm telling a story. I'm having to tell a story here about a person with things you know rather than with um words so well yeah i mean that goes back to what i was saying about how you like kind of uniquely get to tell the backstory you know you t- you tell sort of maybe the the uh, prologue to what we're watching and, and hearing through dialogue you know the only way we're going to know what happened before that is by looking at what you've put in the scene which i, I think is incredibly cool yeah the story the story story sort of starts out within the first five minutes yeah. Um, Phil grilling just goes. His brother about okay, what are we? What's our anniversary? You know, we've got an anniversary here. What is it? You know, and it's you know nineteen naught naught nineteen hundred is when we did our first cattle drive on our own. You know, so we're already looking back into a very stark period of the family history. You know, and I think that that was that sort of has a sort of a fundamental knock on effect to everything we're doing. We're looking back in so many ways at this at what happened in around 1900 with Bronco Henry that yeah. has brought to this point, you know, so, you know, it's a very powerful beat, I think. You know. Yeah. Um, speaking of uh, briefly about, you know, the light again, where uh, I, from what I remember, I, Netflix was uh, uh, very graciously allowed me to go to their screening room and see it um, huh. maybe two months ago. And uh, so I'm having to recall it, but I, I remember thinking, um, that there were no, I have notes for Ari, but, uh, the, I remember that, that all the, almost everything was natural light. Um, does that check out, was that kind of how the house was designed? Like we're not putting any practicals or anything like that. Or did you have to, uh, outside of the film, make considerations for interior lights, like film lights? Yeah. Yeah. yeah cool. I mean, so much as thought is put into this. Um, the, the house would, would have been built in about 1880s. So, before electricity was available in the back back blocks of Montana, um, so uh, in my view, it, the it was the electricity was sort of um, put in there, sort of post the post the building of the house, and and it would have been probably run off a generator on the farm somewhere, you know, a smallest generator. So it never really the lights never really generate that much kind of lightness to the um, listen to the practical lighting. However, there's large windows that let light in, and so hence you get this very stark um, inside-outside kind of feel to it. So all those sorts of things were kind of thought through. We put these um, really nice Holland blinds. We call them Holland blinds, those those sort of um, um, translucent plain blinds across the window. So we can adjust the amount of um, direct light coming, coming into the set. Of course, those were interior sets were built on stage, so um, you know all that was done with with, with um, stage lighting, and the the back the backdrops were um, were um, photographic um, printed, uh, like uh, what, what do you call them, Vista lights or something, or um, 
oh, what yeah, are they called? They weren't backlit. They were frontlit. Actually, that's all we could afford. In fact, oh, they oh, oh. They weren't, they weren't translites. They were they were frontlit. Translite. Um, um, essentially billboard technology, actually, you know, so we have to sort of understand the sort of scale of the film we're doing here. It's not a $200 million film or anything like that. It's a little smaller than that. But so we, I had these sort of billboard type things that we had photographed from the actual location, which was nice and photoshopped them and sort of put them outside there to, um, to emulate these. And I think they went re really well, but I would never have known. Lit, yeah, because Ari sort of overlit them. You got get that sort of um, contrasting of, of um, sort of almost sort of peeking out outside, and the blackness on the inside was, was a style we wanted to do. Yeah, no, it it photograph the uh, that set photographs beautifully. Um, I want to be uh, conscious of your time here, but I was wondering if uh, if you have a moment, if you could maybe give a few. And if this is too big of a question, feel free to skip it. But I was wondering if, you know, this podcast is intended to be educational to a degree. And uh, I was wondering if you had any tips for maybe students or indie uh, filmmakers who are trying to raise the production value of their film on a budget. Uh, maybe some things that come to mind that could could help them out, uh, especially, you know, if you're shooting in an apartment with white walls. That's always a big <laughs> issue, mm. you know, yeah. th little things like that. Yeah, I guess it's just um, control, you know, being able to have control and also to be to be really conscious about what the overarching look of the film is going to be. You know, people experience these things might be like an hour and a half of their lives that's spent kind of in a black room. So you've got this immersive kind of um, experience and it's like a one-off, you know, it's, it's, it's um, sort of starts and finishes with your you know, in my instance, with your production design. And so you're able to tell a story with that. And so if you're able to control all these places and be really conscious of the choices that are made with um, layering up these sort of insides to be able to um, bolster the narrative is what it's all about. So, you know, you don't necessarily need a huge amount of money for these things. You just need to be very conscious about what you are trying to say here. You know, what, and, um, and also, um, I guess it's, I guess, you know, it's, it's interesting, actually, just to rave on about story for a bit. I, I read a book recently called by Nuval Hariri called Sapiens. It's sort of like a, a um, it's a story of the, the human sort of story. And, um, and it talks a lot about the importance of storytelling in our culture. We tell stories to each other, like, like I'm telling you a story now. Um, but it's also, we tell stories with, um, uh, to, about ourselves a lot, you know, about what clothes we put on in the morning is a story we're telling to the world. Mm. What sort of cars we drive is, is a statement about what where our aspirations are or our, um, you know, what, you know, what we're thinking of at the time or, you know, and all these sorts of choices are beautifully layered and nuanced and we can, we quote these, you know, we can quote these things when you're doing production design to flesh out a, a character or a dramatic instance, and it's not necessarily the most expensive thing. Usually, it's, it's, as often as not, it's just you know, just looking for these clues and um, trying to sort of holistically bring them together into a to tell the story. So, yeah, yeah, almost like uh, set the frame, set the story in the frame, and then put the actor in it. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, and you can tell. You know, when actors first get, just going back to clothes for a minute, when actors first put on their clothes. And they are becoming a another person in a way, like the character that they'll be playing in the story. It's a it's quite a revelatory kind of thing. I remember seeing I remember seeing Sir Ian McClellan put on Gandalf's costume for the first time and you know, sort of standing in front of the mirror and taking a pose and, you know, sort of being that person for a moment. You know, it's 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 really interesting, you know. And I think that why not? The same thing with a set, you know, with a or with a dressed environment, you know, when actors walk into a place, it's like putting on their costume for the first time. Oh, so this is my world. This is my life, you know. Right. And it could be yeah. a submarine. It could be the spaceship, like you say. It's all those sorts of things. But it's it's um, yeah, it's, it's the storytelling thing is very powerful kind of thing in our culture. Yeah, I'll have to pick up that book. Um, is there anything, uh, sort of quickly, uh, that comes off the top of your head practically that you should avoid doing as a, uh, maybe like a set designer or something like that? Yeah. Don't have a big ego about things. You know, it's a, it's a collaborative thing. 
um, be, um, you know, don't think that you've got the answer to everything as well. Because, you know, we, we as you know, as a cinematographer, we, we are from a shot to shot, we're doing something that hasn't been done before. You know, so we're continually um, doing new things, you know, new, new, new. So the best thing you can do is just to, you know, get as much experience as you possibly can, but not um, think that um, you're sort of bigger than everything else, you know. That's a, that's a wonderful, um, it's a gestalt thing, isn't it? When everybody works together and you end up making a product that's far bigger than each individual, you know. So the collaborative exercise is, is um, to be celebrated, really. Yeah. And give it um, time. Well, I, I would tell, sorry, to, to no, go ahead. Um, hop on about this. I'd, if you're making a career in production design and in anything, you know, cinematography as well, don't be in such a hurry to get behind the camera. Things you've got to do, you've got to pace yourself, pace your career to learn all these individual skills before you um, take on the responsibility of, of being a designer, in my instance. Yeah, well, and uh, something we've talked about a lot recently is um, n- knowing how to do something doesn't mean that you're qualified to do it. Yeah, it takes right. You have to actually do it first so <laughs> maybe give yourself a uh, a safe place so to speak to uh hone those skills physically before moving on and telling someone yeah i'll shoot your commercial and then you have no idea like walkie talkie <laughs> etiquette you know <laughs> yeah, indeed. um so the way that i like to end all these podcasts is with the same two questions and actually i was listening doing some uh, research i heard a podcast you did where this guy took he didn't take it. He did this interview forever ago, but he took my two questions and now I don't feel unique. I thought these are mildly unique, but I'm going to ask him. Hopefully your answer has changed if anyone's, uh, you know, going through your podcasts. Uh, and the first one is, is what is a piece of advice that maybe you were given or something you read that um, kind of stuck with you throughout your career that you think uh, has kind of helped you along the way? Yeah, look, I'm sorry to have to go back on this, but let's make it real. Make it real. Um uh, as I mentioned before, with the Peter Jackson instance, you know, um, if people do not believe you're in a particular place at a particular time, then they're not going to believe the um, drama that's happening in it. You know, all this sort of stuff is, is um, sort of, we, we make all this stuff. We make all this stuff from nothing. And we're talking, we're, we're taking people on a journey. Um, we have to... Um, take people out of there, you know, when people go to the cinema, we're taking them out of their everyday thing and taking them on a creative, um, imaginative um, journey. And, and as soon as people are not in that journey, not in in that world, then um, we lose we lose their imagination, we lose the, their, their concentration and their sort of devotion to the story. So, you know, from my point of view, it's to do with um, just making the whole environment as real as possible. Yeah. You know, I have to, uh, uh, sort of, what do you call it? Uh, confess. I, I haven't, I saw return of the King in theaters. I haven't seen the first two, but I have watched the like 12 hour behind the scenes on the DVDs <laughs> for oh, all that. three of those films. <laughs> right. It's longer so, than the, uh, the Beatles one he did recently. So, <laughs> Oh, wait, so long. And I love it. It's like my favorite. It's, it's in my opinion, it is the pinnacle of behind this. You know, I, I'm considering myself one of those, like, you know, learned off behind the scenes features on DVDs and the Lord of the Rings box set is like the top of the, the, wow. the peak of it for how detailed all of those, uh, uh, featurettes are. Um, and I know that's going to make some people angry, but <laughs> I just got them in 4K Blu-ray. I'm going to watch them and like, you know, it'll be great. Um, but uh, second question, kind of easier. And I'm, I'm, I'm changing it you know, recent, uh, recently, so maybe this won't work. But it used to be uh, just recommend a film that isn't yours for people to see. Or if Power of the Dog is in a double feature, what's the other movie? Oh boy, that's actually quite hard because I've what I've seen so many films, and there are just so many amazing films out there. They sort of, I, it's hard to sort of, it's hard to pick one, you know, because I, t- I tend to um, the ones that have the most resonance are the ones that I've seen most recently. I just adored sure. Dune, and I adored the Denise Villeneuve's one he did before that, the Blade Runner. Um, yeah. sort of, um, was it a prequel or a remake or something like that? They sequel, sequel. They have so much power to me. You know, not only 
as a um, as a story that's very succinct in many ways, but also just the visionary the visionary world that he he brings to the cinema is just phenomenal. You know, and I, I can see that they're not everyone's cup of tea. You know, they're not they're not like multi billion dollar things that that um, you know the box office. But for, to us cinephiles, it's like it's like the it's right up there. I would say. Right yeah, up. I so, you know, heads off to him. I was just able to see uh, Dune in the like really nice Dolby theater, um, yes. not the not the Dolby Chinese theater, but like the the nice you know. And boy, that's a that's an experience. I wish yeah, I could have saw Blade Runner like that. It's a must see on IMAX in a way, you know. I I, I, yes. I had to wait in, in Auckland because of COVID and all sorts of things to be able to wait, and everyone else had seen it, but I had, I, I did was disciplined and I thought right, I'm only going to see this on IMAX, and it was worth the wait. Honestly, absolutely, you know? yeah. yeah. And then Blade Runner obviously is just uh, world building on top of world building. But um, yeah, Blade, Blade Runner to me was probably you know was even bigger because it had more had more um, places and, and more sort of design input uh, d- design items in there that I was just you know an old with so yeah. yeah it it's that's a film that I think every I want to say every filmmaker but especially young filmmakers have all just really jumped on as being like when you when being taken away somewhere that film just mm. nailed it yeah yeah same with Dune, but Dune's a lot harder to see yourself in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I'm looking, forward to, a... I'm looking forward to Dune 2, actually, because I, I read the book, you know, actually, I, sure. in a very similar time frame to reading Lord of the Rings, actually, because it came out in the 1970s, I recall. But, um, yeah, it had a lot of um, um, profound impact on me reading the book. You know, we were talking about sort of the imagination and how you conjure up these sort of visions in your head. That's what Dune did for me, you know, because there was no movie of it back then and you had to sort of rely on your own imagination. And boy, it was, he did a great job and um, Denis Villeneuve did a great job in bringing those sort of visions to them. To the cinema. Yeah. yeah, the books are great. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, I, again, I want to be conscious of your time. I want to keep you all morning, but uh, thank you so, so much for uh, spending the hour with me. I, I really appreciate it. It's uh, like I said, I'm a, I'm a big fan, but also uh, I just think your job's really cool. So it's, it's great to uh, kind of pick your brain for a bit. Yeah. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Really nice to be able to talk about um, broader design things, you know, like um, influences and things. So yeah. Great. Thank yeah. you. Awesome. Yeah. Well, next time you do something, uh, we'll be sure to have you back. All right. Look forward to it. Frame and Reference is an Owlbot production. It's produced and edited by me, Kenny McMillan, and distributed by Pro Video Coalition. Our theme song is written and performed by Mark Pelly, and the Ethidart Matbox logo was designed by Nate Truax of Truax Branding Company. You can read or watch the podcast you've just heard by going to ProVideoCoalition.com or YouTube.com slash Owlbot, respectively. And as always, thanks for listening.